Welcome to the Buddhist Bookshelf. In Episode 5, we delve into the Sarla's Flowers by Tien Phuc, a treasury of 560-plus Buddha Dharma lessons. Your support, through likes, shares, and subscriptions, is invaluable as we explore the depths of this profound book together. Join us on this enlightening journey. 75. Ten Armies of Mara According to the Napada Sutta. The Buddha taught. If the Buddha is one foot tall, the demons will make themselves ten feet tall, if the Buddha is ten feet tall, the demon stands just above the Buddha's head. Nevertheless, if the Buddha grows taller still and exceeds the demons in height, the demons will surrender to the Buddha. This teaching means if the Buddha is not taller than the demons, he will be subverted. In the same manner, cultivados should always ensure that his own Buddha is taller than that of the demons under any circumstances, otherwise, he will be subverted and vanquished. Therefore, cultivators who fail and retrogress should not blame external circumstances or anyone. They should only blame themselves for being weaker than the demon. If they persist in holding fast to their vows and determination, demonic obstacles will disappear. The first Mara is sensual desires, comma p. We are usually attracted by sweet sounds, rich smells, beautiful ideas, and other delightful objects that touched all our six sense doors. As a natural result of encountering these objects, desire arises. Pleasant objects and desire are the two bases of sense pleasure. Besides, our attachments to family, property, work and friends are also considered troops of this first army. The second Mara is discouragement, Arati P. We always have a tendency not satisfied with what we have in our life. We may feel dissatisfied with family, housing, food or with any other small things. To overcome this discontent, we should listen to the teachings of the Buddha on the impermanence of everything, then we can get rid of all kinds of attachments. Then rapture, joy and comfort will arise naturally from our concentrated mind. The third Mara is hunger and thirst, Kapapasa P. Are we hungry of food? In fact, we may not be hungry for food, but also for clothing, entertainment, and other hobbies, such as collection of antiques, bonsai, and so on. This notion of hunger and thirst relates to the entire range of needs and requirements in both physical and mental areas. If we can restrain ourselves from these desires, then the third Mara army cannot disturb us. The fourth Mara is attachment, Tanha P. When eyes contact pleasurable objects, ears listen to good sounds, nose smells good smell, tongues tastes tasteful food, body touches likable things, and so on, cravings arise. Therefore, if we do not have mindfulness, cravings will arise. The fifth Mara is sloth and torpor, the Namita P. Sloth is sluggishness or dullness of mind. Its characteristic is lack of driving power. Its function is to dispel energy. It is manifested as the sinking of the mind. Its proximate cause is unwise attention to boredom, drowsiness, etc. Sloth is identified as sickness of consciousness or satajalana. According to most venerable Piyudasi in the Buddha's ancient path Dina or Midda is sloth or morbid state of the mind and mental properties. It is not, as some are inclined to think, sluggishness of the body, for even the arahats, the perfect ones, who are free from this ill, also experience bodily fatigue. This sloth and torpor, like butter too stiff to spread, make the mind rigid and inert, and thus lessen the practitioner's enthusiasm and earnestness for meditation, so that he becomes mentally sick and lazy. Laxity leads to greater slackness until finally there arises a state of callous indifference. The sixth Mara is fear, by P. Ordinary fear is a sinking sign of anger. When we cannot face the problem, we show no reaction outwardly and wait for the opportunity to run away. But if we can face our probal directly, with an open and relaxed mind, fear will not arise. The seventh Mara is doubt, Visakika P. Doubt signifies spiritual doubt, from a Buddhist perspective, the inability to place confidence in the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, and the training. Doubting is natural. Everyone starts with doubts. We can learn a great deal from them. What is important is that we do not identify with our doubts. That is, do not get caught up in them, letting our mind spin in endless circles. Instead, 
watch the whole process of doubting, of wondering. See who it is that doubts. See how doubts come and go. Then we will no longer be victimized by our doubts. We will step outside of them, and our mind will be quiet. We can see how all things come and go. Let go of our doubts and simply watch. This is how to end doubting. The eighth Mara is defamation mocking. If someone insults us and spreads tales about us, we should not mind. We should let it pass, come what may. The entire episode will eventually calm down all by itself. If someone mock us, even a little, we cannot stand it, and it is a very uncomfortable sensation. The ninth Mara is gain, praise, honor, and ill-gotten fame, Labha Saloka Sakara Mikayasa P. We become pleased when we gain benefits and are sad when we lose them. This shows a lack of samadhi power. No matter what difficulties arise, we ought to take them in stride and then not be upset when we lose out. When others praise us, it tastes as sweet as honey, it is a comfortable sensation. If we are praised by someone and he makes our name known, we should take it in stride and regard glory and honor as no more important than forced on the window pane at dawn. The tenth Mara is self-praise and contempt for others, Adikamsanaprabhambana p. Conceit is really a fearsome mental state. It destroys gratitude, and it makes more difficult for us to acknowledge that we owe any kind of debt to another person. It causes us to forget the good deeds others have done for us in the past. Because of conceit, we belittle and denigrate other people. 76. Non attachment. Our world is a world of desire. Every living being comes forth from desire and endures as a combination of desires. We are born from the desires of our father and mother. Then, when we emerge into this world, we become infatuated with many things and become ourselves. Well springs of desire. We relish physical comforts and the enjoyments of the senses. Thus, we are strongly attached to the body. But if we consider this attachment, we will see that this is a potential source of sufferings and afflictions. For the body is constantly changing. We wish we could remain alive forever, but moment after moment the body is passing from youth to old age, from life to death. We may be happy while we are young and strong, but when we contemplate sickness, old age, and the ever-present threat of death, anxiety overwhelms us. Thus, we seek to elude the inevitable by evading the thought of it. The lust for life and the fear of death are forms of attachment. We are also attached to our clothes, our car, our storied houses, and our wealth. Besides, we are also attached to memories concerning the past or anticipations of the future. According to the Vajra Sutra, the Buddha taught. Anything with shape or form is considered a dharma born of conditions. All things born of conditions are like dreams, illusory transformations, bubbles of foam, and shadows. Like dewdrops and lightning, they are false and unreal. By contemplating everything in this way, we will be able to understand the truth, let go of attachments, and put an end to random thoughts. All things born of conditions are like dreams. Like illusions, bubbles, and shadows, like dewdrops, like flashes of lightning. Contemplate them in these ways. According to the Sutra in 42 sections, Chapter 18, the Buddha said, My Dharma is the mindfulness that is both mindfulness and no mindfulness. It is the practice that is both practice and non-practice. It is words that are words and non-words. It is cultivation that is cultivation and non-cultivation. Those who understand are near to it, those who are confused are far from it indeed. The path of words and language is cut off, it cannot be categorized as a thing. If you are off, removed, by a hair's breadth, you lose it in an instant. 77. 5 Aggregates. Skanda in Sanskrit means group, aggregate, or heap. In Buddhism, skanda means the trunk of a tree, or a body. Skanda also means the five aggregates or five aggregates of conditioned phenomena, constituents, or the five causally conditioned elements of existence forming a being or entity. According to Buddhist philosophy, each individual existence is composed of the five elements, and because they are constantly chanting, so those who attempt to cling to the self are subject to suffering. 
though these factors are often referred to as the aggregates of attachment because they are impermanent and changing, ordinary people always develop desires for them. According to the Prajnaparamita Heart Sutra, the five aggregates are compassed of form, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. Generally speaking, the five aggregates mean men and the world of phenomena. Things that cover or conceal, implying that physical and mental forms obstruct realization of the truth. An accumulation or heap, implying the five physical and mental constituents, which combine to form the intelligence or nature, and rupa. The skandhas refer only to the phenomenal, not to the non-phenomenal. In order to overcome all sufferings and troubles, Buddhists should engage in the practice of profound prajnaparamita and perceive that the five aggregates are empty of self-existence. The Buddha reminded Sariputra. O oh Sariputra, form is not different from emptiness, and emptiness is not different from form. Form is emptiness and emptiness is form. The same can be said of feelings, perceptions, actions and consciousnesses. We, ordinary people, do not see the five aggregates as phenomena, but as an entity because of our deluded minds, and our innate desire to treat these as a self in order to pander to our self-importance. According to the Sanjiti Sutta in the Long Discourses of the Buddha, there are five aggregates, five skandhas. The aggregates which make up a human being. The five skandhas are the roots of all ignorance. They keep sentient beings from realizing their always existing Buddha nature. The five aggregates are considered as maras or demons fighting against the Buddha nature of men. In accordance with the Dharma, life is comprised of five aggregates, form, feeling, perception, mental formation, consciousness. Matter plus the four mental factors classified below as feeling, perception, mental formation and consciousness, combined together from life. The real nature of these five aggregates is explained in the teaching of the Buddha as follows. Matter is equated to a heap of foam, feeling is like a bubble, perception is described as a mirage, mental formations are like a banana tree, and consciousness is just an illusion. According to the Surangama Sutra, Book 2, the Buddha reminded Ananda about the five skandhas as follows. Ananda. You have not yet understood that all the defiling objects that appear, all the illusory ephemeral characteristics, spring up in the very spot where they also come to an end. They are what is called illusory falseness. But their nature is in truth the bright substance of wonderful enlightenment. Thus it is throughout, up to the five skandhas and the six entrances, to the twelve places and the eighteen realms, the union and mixture of various causes and conditions, account for their illusory and false existence. And the separation and dispersion of the causes and conditions, result in their illusory and false extinction. Who would have thought that production, extinction, coming, and going are fundamentally the everlasting, wonderful light of the treasury of the thus come one, the unmoving, all-pervading perfection, the wonderful nature of true suchness. If within the true and permanent nature one seeks coming and going, confusion and enlightenment, or birth and death, there is nothing that can be obtained. Ananda. Why do I say that the five skandhas are basically the wonderful nature of true suchness, the treasury of the thus come one? The Buddha taught in the Satipatthana Sutra. If you have patience and the will to see things as they truly are. If you would turn inwards to the recesses of your own minds and note with just bare attention, sadi not objectively without projecting an ego into the process, then cultivate this practice for a sufficient length of time, then you will see these five aggregates not as an entity, but as a series of physical and mental processes. Then you will not mistake the superficial for the real. You will then see that these aggregates arise and disappear in rapid succession, never being the same for two consecutive moments, never static but always in a state of flux never being but always becoming. And the Buddha continued to teach in the Lankavatara Sutra. The Tathagata is neither different nor not different from the Skandhas. Skandhabhyo nanyo nanaya's Tathagata. The first aggregate is the form Skandha. The form Skandha or the aggregate of matter, four elements of our own body and other material objects such as solidity, fluidity, heat and motion comprise matter. 
The aggregative form includes the five physical sense organs and the corresponding physical objects of the sense organs, the eyes and visible objects, the ears and sound, the nose and smell, the tongue and taste, the skin and tangible objects. There are several different categories of rupa. Inner rupa is the organs of sense, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body. Outer rupa is the objects of sense, color, sound, smell, taste, touch. Visible objects, white, blue, yellow, red, etc. Invisible objects, sound, smell, taste, touch. Invisible immaterial or abstract objects. Form is used more in the sense of substance or something occupying space, which will resist replacement by another form. So it has extension, it is limited and conditioned. It comes into existence when conditions are matured, as Buddhists would say, and staying as long as they continue, pass away. Form is impermanent, dependent, illusory, relative, antithetical, and distinctive. Things with shape and features are forms. Forms include all colors which can dim our eyes. Ordinarily speaking, we are confused with forms when we see them, hear sounds and be confused by them, smell sense and be confused by them taste flavors and be confused by them, or feel sensations and be confused by them. In the classic of the way and its virtue, it is said. The five colors blind the eyes, the five musical notes deafen the ears, and the five flavors dull the palate. Therefore, in the Heart Sutra, the Buddha taught. If we can empty out the aggregate of form, then we can realize a state of there being no mind inside, no body outside, and no things beyond. If we can follow what the Buddha taught, we are no longer attached to forms, we are totally liberated. According to the Surigama Sutra, the Buddha taught. Ananda. Consider this example. When a person who has pure clear eyes look at clear bright emptiness, he sees nothing but clear emptiness, and he is quite certain that nothing exists within it. If for no apparent reason, the peasant does not move his eyes, the staring will cause fatigue and then of his own accord, he will see strange flowers in space and other unreal appearances that are wild and disordered. You should know that it is the same with the Skanda form. Ananda. The strange flowers come neither from emptiness nor from the eyes. The reason for this, Ananda, is that if the flowers were to come from emptiness, they would return to emptiness. If there is a coming out and going in, the space would not be empty. If emptiness were not empty, then it could not contain the appearance of the aerosol and extinction of the flowers, just as Ananda's body cannot contain another Ananda. If the flowers were to come from the eyes, they would return to the eyes. If the nature of the flowers were to come from the eyes, it would be endowed with the faculty of seeing. If it could see, then when it left the eyes it would become flowers in space, and when it returned it should see the eyes. If it did not see, then when it left the eyes it would obscure emptiness, and when it returned, it would obscure the eyes. Moreover, when you see the flowers, your eyes should not be obscured. So why it is that the eyes are said to be pure and bright when they see clear emptiness? Therefore, you should know that the skanda of form is empty and false, because it neither depends on causes and conditions for existence, nor is spontaneous in nature. The skanda of form relates to the physical body, while the remaining four concern the mind. The skanda of rupa, or that which has form. According to most venerable Piyadasi in the Buddha's ancient path matter contains and comprises the four great primaries, which are traditionally known as solidity, fluidity, heat or temperature, and motion or vibration. However, they are not simply earth, water, fire and wind, though conventionally they may be so called. In Buddhist thought, especially in the Abhidhamma, the higher doctrine, they are more than that. The second aggregate is the feeling or sensation. Feeling is knowledge obtained by the senses, feeling sensation. It is defined as mental reaction to the object, but in general it means receptivity or sensation. Feeling is also a mind which experiences either pleasure, unpleasure or indifference, pleasant, unpleasant, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. The aggregate of feelings refers to the feelings that we experience. For instance, a certain state arises, we accept it without thinking about it, and we feel comfortable or uncomfortable. 
when we eat some delicious food and its flavor makes us feel quite pleasant, this is what we mean by feelings. If we wear a fine suit and it makes us feel quite attractive, this is also what we mean by feelings. If we live in a nice house that we feel like it, this is a feeling. If we drive a nice car that we love to have, this also a feeling. All experiences that our body accepts and enjoys are considered to be the aggregate of feelings. When we meet attractive objects, we develop pleasurable feelings and detachment which create karma for us to be reborn in samsara. In the contrary, when we meet undesirable objects, we develop painful or unpleasurable feelings which also create karma for us to be reborn in samsara. When we meet objects that are neither attractive nor unattractive, we develop indifferent feelings which develop ignorant self-grasping also create karma for us to be reborn in samsara. All actions performed by our body, speech and mind are felt and experienced, Buddhism calls this feeling, and the Buddha confirmed in the Twelve Nidanas, that feeling creates karma, either positive or negative, which causes rebirths in samsara. Ananda. Consider the example of a person whose hands and feet are relaxed and at ease, and whose entire body is in balance and harmony. He is unaware of his life processes because there is nothing agreeable or disagreeable in his nature. However, for some unknown reason, the person rubs his two hands together in emptiness, and sensations of roughness, smoothness, cold, and warmth seem to arise from nowhere between his palms. You should know that it is the same with the skanda of feeling. Ananda. All this illusory contact does not come from emptiness, nor does it come from the hand. The reason for this, Ananda, is that if it came from emptiness, then since it could make contact with the palms, why wouldn't it make contact with the body? It should not be that emptiness chooses what it comes in contact with. If it came from the palms, it could be readily felt without waiting for the two palms to be joined. What is more, if it were to come from the palms, then the palms would know when they were joined. When they separated, the contact would return into the arms, the wrists, the bones, and the marrow, and you also should be aware of the course of its entry. It should also be perceived by the mind because it would behave like something coming in and going out of the body. In that case, what need would there be to put the two palms together to experience what is called contact? Therefore, you should know that the skanda of feeling is empty and false, because it neither depends on causes and conditions for existence, nor is spontaneous in nature. According to most venerable Piyudasi in the Buddha's ancient path, all our feelings are included in the group of aggregate of feeling. Feelings are threefold. Pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. They arise dependent on contact. Seeing a form, hearing a sound, smelling an odor, tasting a flavor, touching some tangible thing, conizing a mental object, either an idea or a thought, man experiences feeling. When, for instance, I, form and I consciousness, kaku vinana, come together, it is their coincidence that is called contact. Contact means the combination of the organ of sense, the object of sense, and sense consciousness. When these are all present together there is no power or force that can prevent the arising of feeling. Practitioners of mindfulness should always contemplate various kinds of feelings such as pleasant, unpleasant and neutral feelings. To understand thoroughly how these feelings arise, develop after their arising, and pass away. To contemplate that feelings only arise when there is contact between the senses. To contemplate all of the above to have a better understanding of feelings. No matter what kinds of feelings, pleasant, unpleasant or indifference, they all lead to sufferings. The third aggregate is the thought, cognition or perception, or aggregate of perception. Activity of recognition or identification or attaching of a name to an object of experience. Perceptions include form, sound, smell, taste, bodily impression or touch, and mental objects. The aggregate of thoughts refers to our thinking processes. When our five sense organs perceive the five sense objects, a variety of idle thoughts arise. Many ideas suddenly come to mind and are suddenly gone. Ideas of forms, ideas of feelings. According to the Surangama Sutra, Nalkfat Dei. Ananda. 
consider the example of a person whose mouth waters at the mention of sour plums, or the soles of whose feet tingle when he thinks about walking along a precipice. You should know that it is the same with the scandi of thinking. Ananda. You should know that the watering of the mouth caused by the mention of the plums does not come from the plums, nor does it come from the mouth. The reason for this, Ananda, is that if it were produced from the plums, the plums should speak for themselves, why wait for someone to mention them? If it came from the mouth, the mouth itself should hear, and what need would there be to wait for the ear? If the ear alone heard, then why doesn't the water come out of the ear? Thinking about walking along a precipice is explained in the same way. Therefore, you should know that the scandal of thinking is empty and false, since it neither depends upon causes and conditions for existence, nor is spontaneous in nature. According to most venerable Piyudasi in the Buddha's ancient path, the function of perception is recognition of objects both physical and mental. Perception, like feeling, also is sixfold. Perception of forms, sounds, smells, tastes, bodily contacts, and mental objects. Perception in Buddhism is not used in the sense that some Western philosophers like Bacon, or Descartes, etc. used the term, but as a mere sense perception. There is a certain affinity between awareness, a function of consciousness, and recognition, a function of perception. While consciousness becomes aware of an object, simultaneously the mental factor of perception takes the distinctive mark of the object and thus distinguishes it from other objects. This distinctive mark is instrumental in conizing the object a second and a third time, and in fact, every time we become aware of the object. Thus, it is perception that brings about memory. The fourth skanda is the formation skanda, impression, or mental formation. Aggregate of mental formation is a conditioned response to the object of experience including volition, attention, discrimination, resolve, etc. The aggregate of activities refers to a process of shifting and flowing. The aggregate of activities leads us to come and go, to go and come without end in a constant, ceaseless flowing pattern. Our idle thoughts compel us to impulsively do good or do evil, and such thoughts then manifest in our actions and our words. According to the Surangama Sutra, the Buddha taught. Ananda. Consider, for example, a swift rapids whose waves follow upon one another in orderly succession, the ones behind never overtaking the ones in front. You should know that it is the same with the skanda of mental formation. Ananda. Thus the nature of the flow does not arise because of emptiness, nor does it come into existence because of the water. It is not the nature of water, and yet it is not separate from either emptiness or water. The reason for this, Ananda, is that if it arose because of emptiness, then the inexhaustible emptiness throughout the ten directions would become an inexhaustible flow, and all the worlds would inevitably be drowned. If the swift rapids existed because of water, then their nature would differ from that of water, and the location and characteristics of its existence would be apparent. If their nature were simply that of water, then when they became still and clear they would no longer be made up of water. Suppose it were to separate from emptiness and water, there isn't anything outside of emptiness, and outside of water there isn't any flow. Therefore, you should know that the skanda of mental formation is empty and false, since it neither depends upon causes and conditions for existence, nor is spontaneous in nature. According to most venerable Piyudasi in the Buddha's ancient path aggregate of volational formations, include all mental factors except feeling and perception. The Abhidhamma speaks of 52 mental concomitants or factors, satasika. Feeling and perception are two of them, but they are not volitional activities. The remaining 50 are collectively known as mental or volitional formations. Volition, satana, plays a very important role in the mental realm. In Buddhism, no action is considered as kama if that action is void of volition. And like feeling and perception, it is of six kinds. Volition directed to forms, sounds, smells, tastes, bodily contacts and mental objects. The fifth skanda is the skanda of consciousness. Aggregate of consciousness includes the six types of consciousness, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching and mental consciousness. Awareness or sensitivity to an object, 
i.e. the consciousness associates with the physical factors when the eye and a visible object come into contact, and awareness of a visible object occurs in our mind. Consciousness or a turning of a mere awareness into personal experience is a combined function of feeling, perception and mental formation. The aggregate of consciousness refers to the process of discrimination. As soon as a situation appears, we begin to discriminate in our thoughts about that situation. For example, when we see something beautiful, we have thoughts of fondness towards it, and when we hear ugly sounds, we have thoughts of dislike for those sounds. All such discriminations are part of this aggregate. According to the Surangama Sutra, the Buddha taught. Ananda. Consider, for example, a man who picks up a Kalavinka pitcher and stops up its two holes. He lift up the pitcher filled with emptiness and, walking some thousand mile away, presents it to another country. You should know that the skanda of consciousness is the same way. Thus, Ananda, the space does not come from one place, nor does it go to another. The reason for this, Ananda, is that if it were to come from another place, then when the stored up emptiness in the pitcher went elsewhere, there would be less emptiness in the place where the pitcher was originally. If it were to enter this region, when the holes were unplugged and the pitcher was turned over, one would see emptiness come out. Therefore, you should know that the skanda of consciousness is empty and false, since it neither depends upon causes and conditions for existence, nor is spontaneous in nature. According to most venerable Piyadasi in the Buddha's ancient path, aggregate of consciousness is the most important of the aggregates, for it is the receptacle, so to speak, for all the 52 mental concomitants or factors, since without consciousness, no mental factors are available. Consciousness and the factors are interrelated, interdependent, and coexistent. Aggregate of consciousness has six types, and its function is varied. It has its basis and objects. All our feelings are experienced through the contact of sense faculties with the external world. Although there is this functional relationship between the faculties and their objects, for instance, eye with forms, ear with sounds, and so on, awareness comes through consciousness. In other words, sense objects cannot be experienced with the particular sensitivity without the appropriate kind of consciousness. Now when eye and form are both present, visual consciousness arises dependent on them. Similarly with ear and sound, and so on, down to mind and mental objects. Again, when the three things, eye, form, and eye consciousness come together, it is their coincidence that is called contact. From contact comes feeling and so on. Thus, consciousness originates through a stimulus arising in the five sense doors and the mind door, the sixth. As consciousness arises through the interaction of the sense faculties and the sense objects, it also is conditioned and not independent. It is not a spirit or soul opposed to matter. Thoughts and ideas which are food for the sixth faculty called mind are also dependent and conditioned. They depend on the external world which the other five sense faculties experience. The five faculties contact objects only in the present, that is when objects come in direct contact with the particular faculty. The mind faculty, however, can experience the sense object, whether it is form, sound, smell, taste, or thought already cognized by the sense organs. For instance, a visible object, with which the eye came in contact in the past, can be visualized by the mind faculty just at this moment, although the object is not before the eye. Similarly with the other sense objects. This is subjective, and it is difficult to experience some of these sensations. This sort of activity of the mind is subtle and sometimes beyond ordinary comprehension. 99. Four Elements four great elements of which all things are made, produce and maintain life. These four elements are interrelated and inseparable. However, one element may preponderate over another. They constantly change, not remaining the same even for two consecutive moments. According to Buddhism, matter endures only for 17 thought moments, while scientists tell us that matter endures only for 10 27th of a second. No matter what we say, a human body is temporary, it is created artificially through the accumulation of the four elements. Once death arrives, the body deteriorates to return to the soil, 
water-based substances will gradually dry up and return to the great water, the element of fire is lost, and the body becomes cold, and the great wind no longer works within the body. At that time, the spirit must follow the karma each person has created while living to change lives and be reincarnated into the six realms, altering image, exchange body, etc. in the sills of births and deaths. According to the Sastra on the Prajna Sutra, there are 404 ailments caused by the four elements in the body. 101 fevers caused by the earth element. 101 fevers caused by the fire element. 101 chills caused by the water element. 101 chills caused by the wind element. Solid matter or earth. Prithan means the element of extension, the substratum of matter. Without it objects have no form, nor can they occupy space. The qualities of hardness and softness are two conditions of this element. After death, these parts will decay and deteriorate to become soil. For this reason, they belong to the great soil. Earth is considered as one of the four poisonous snakes in a basket, which imply the four elements in a body, of which a man is formed. According to most venerable Piyudasi in the Buddha's ancient path solidity is the element of expansion. It is due to this element of expansion that objects occupy space. When we see an object we only see something extended in space, and we give a name to it. The element of expansion is present not only in solids, but in liquids, too. 4. When we see the sea stretched before us even then we see the element of expansion or padavi. The hardness of rock and the softness of paste, the quality of heaviness and lightness in things, are also qualities of the element of expansion, or are particular states of it. Water, fluidity, or liquid. Unlike the earth element it is intangible. It is the element which enables the scattered atoms of matter to cohere together. After death, these water-based substances will dry up. In other words, they have returned to water. Fluidity is considered as one of the four poisonous snakes in a basket, which imply the four elements in a body, of which a man is formed. According to most venerable Piyudasi in the Buddha's ancient path fluidity is the element of expansion. It is the element that heaps particles of matter together without allowing them to scatter. The cohesive force in liquids is very strong, for unlike solids, they coalesce, stick together, even after their separation. Once a solid is broken up or separated the particles do nor recoalesce. In order to join them it becomes necessary to convert the solid into a liquid by raising the temperature, as in the welding of metals. When we see an object we only see an expansion with limits, this expansion or shape is possible because of the cohesive force. Fire or heat. Fire element includes both heat and cold and fire element possesses the power of maturing bodies, they are vitalizing energy. Preservation and decay are due to this element. After death, the element of fire is lost, and the body gradually becomes cold. Heat is considered as one of the four poisonous snakes in a basket, which imply the four elements in a body, of which a man is formed. According to most venerable Piyudasi in the Buddha's ancient path temperature is the element of heat. It is the element which matures, intensifies or imparts heat to the other three primaries. The vitality of all beings and plants is preserved by this element. From every expansion and shape we get a sensation of heat. This is relative, for when we say that an object is cold, we only mean that the heat of that particular object is less than our body heat, in other words, the temperature of the object is lower than the temperature of our body. Thus, it is clear that the so-called coldness, too, is an element of heat or temperature, of course in a lower degree. Air, wind, motion, or energy of motion. Air element is the element of motion in the body. After death, breathing ceases, body functions become catatonic or completely rigid, because the great wind no longer works within the body. Air is considered as one of the four poisonous snakes in a basket, which imply the four elements in a body, of which a man is formed. According to most venerable Piyudasi in the Buddha's ancient path wind or air, is the element of motion. It is diblismant, this, too, is relative. To know whether a thing is moving or not, we need a point which we regard as being fixed, by which to measure that motion, 
but there is no absolutely motionless object in the universe. So, the so-called stability, too, is an element of motion. Motion depends on heat. In the complete absence of heat atoms cease to vibrate. Complete absence of heat is only theoretical, we cannot feel it, because then we would not exist, as we, too, are made of atoms. 100. 7 Elements. In the Surangama Sutra, Book 3, Ananda said to the Buddha, World Honored One, the Thus Come One, has often spoken of the mixture and union of causes and conditions, saying that the transformations of everything in the world are created from the mixing and uniting of the four elements. Why does the Thus Come One reject causes and conditions and spontaneity as well? I do not know how to understand your meaning now. Please be so compassionate as to instruct us living beings in the final meaning of the middle way, in the dharmas which are not idle theories. The Buddha then taught Ananda about the seven great elements as follows. Ananda. You have renounced the small vehicle dharmas of the sound hearers and those enlightened to conditions, and have resolved to diligently seek unsurpassed body. Because of that, I will now explain the foremost truth to you. Why do you still bind yourself up in the idle theories and false thoughts current among people of the world? Although you are very learned, you are like someone who can discuss medicines, but cannot distinguish a real medicine when it is placed before you. The thus come one says. That you are truly pitiful. Listen attentively now as I explain this point in detail for you, and also for those of the future who cultivate the great vehicle so that you all can penetrate to the real appearance. Ananda. According to what you said, the mixing and uniting of the four elements create the myriad transformations of everything in the world. Ananda. If the nature of those elements does not mix and unite in substance, then they cannot combine with other elements, just as empty space cannot combine with forms. Assuming that they do not mix and unite, they are then only in a process of transformation, in which they depend on one another for existence from beginning to end. In the course of transformation they are produced and extinguished, being born and then dying, dying and then being born, in birth after birth, in death after death, the way a torch spun in a circle forms an unbroken wheel of flame. Ananda. The process is like water becoming ice and ice becoming water again. The Buddha told Ananda. Ananda. Consider the nature of earth. Its coarse particles make up the great earth, its fine particles make up motes of dust, down to and including motes of dust bordering upon emptiness. Ananda. If one divides those fine motes of dust, their appearance is at the boundaries of form. Then divide those into seven parts. Ananda. If mode of dust bordering upon emptiness is divided and becomes emptiness, it should be that emptiness can give rise to form. Just now you asked if mixing and uniting doesn't bring about the transformations of everything in the world. You should carefully consider how much emptiness mixes and unites to make a single mode of dust bordering upon emptiness, since it makes no sense to say that dust bordering on emptiness is compassed of dust bordering on emptiness. Moreover, since motes of dust bordering upon emptiness can be reduced to emptiness, of how many motes of such form as this must emptiness be compassed? When these motes of form mass together, a mass of form does not make emptiness, when emptiness is massed together, a mass of emptiness does not make form. Besides, although form can be divided, how can emptiness be massed together? You simply do not know that in the treasury of the thus come one, the nature of form is true emptiness, and the nature of emptiness is true form. Pure at its origin, it pervades the Dharma realm. It accords with living beings' minds, in response to their capacity to know. It is experienced to whatever extent is dictated by the law of karma. Ignorant of this fact, people in the world are so deluded as to assign its origin to causes and conditions or to spontaneity. These mistakes, which arise from the discriminations and reasoning processes of the conscious mind, are nothing but the play of empty words which have no real meaning. Ananda. Fire which has no nature of its own, depends upon various causes and conditions for its existence. Consider a family in the city that is not yet eaten. When they wish to prepare food, they hold up a speculum to the sun, seeking fire. Ananda. 
let us look into your suggestion that the fire comes forth from mixing and uniting. By way of example, you and I and the 1250 Bixas unite together to form a community. However, a careful analysis of the community reveals that every member compassing it has his own body, birthplace, clan, and name. For instance, Saraputra is a Brahmin, Uravilva is of the Kasyapa clan, and Ananda come from the Gautama family. Ananda. Suppose fire existed because of mixing and uniting. When the hand holds up the speculum to the sun to seek fire, does the fire come out of the speculum? Does it come out of the moksha tinder? Or does it come from the sun? Suppose, Ananda, that it came from the sun. Not only would it burn the moksha tinder in your hand, but as it came across the groves of trees, it should burn them up as. Well. Suppose that it came from the speculum. Since it came out from within the speculum to ignite the moksha tinder, why doesn't the speculum melt? Yet your hand that holds it feels no heat, how, then, could the speculum melt? Suppose that the fire came from the moksha tinder. Then why is fire generated only when the bright mirror comes into contact with the dazzling light? Furthermore, Ananda, on closer examination, you will find a speculum held in hands, the sun high up in the sky, and moksha tinder grown from the ground. Where does the fire come from? How can it travel some distance to reach here? The sun and the speculum cannot mix and unite, since they are far apart from each other. Nor can it be that the fire exists spontaneously, without an origin. You simply do not know that in the treasury of the thus come one, he nature of fire is true emptiness, and the nature of emptiness is true fire. Pure at its origin, it pervades the Dharma realm. It accords with living beings' minds, in response to their capacity to know. Ananda. You should know that fire is generated in the place where a speculum is held up to the sunlight, and fire will be generated everywhere if specula are held up to the sunlight throughout the Dharma realm. Since fire can come forth throughout the whole world, can there be any fixed place to which it is confined? It is experienced to whatever extent is dictated by the law of karma. People in the world, ignorant of this fact, are so deluded as to assign its origin to causes and conditions or spontaneity. These mistakes, which arise from the discriminations and reasoning processes of the conscious mind, are nothing but the play of empty words which have no real meaning. Ananda. Water is by nature unstable. It may keep on flowing or come to a stop. Kapila, Chakra, Padma, and Hasta, and other great magicians of Sravasti, often hold up instruments to the light of the full moon at midnight, to extract from the moon, the essence of water to mix with their drugs. Does the water come out of the crystal ball? Does it exist of itself in space? Or, does it come from the moon? Ananda. Suppose the water came from the distant moon. Water then should also flow from all the grass and trees, when the moonlight passes over them on its way to the crystal ball. If it does flow from them, why wait for it to come out of the crystal ball? If it does not flow from the trees, then it is clear that the water does not descend from the moon. If it came from the crystal balls, then it should flow from the crystal all the time. Why would they have to wait for mind night and the light of the full moon to receive it? If it came from space, which is by nature boundless, it would flow everywhere, until everything between earth and sky was submerged. How, then, could there still be travel by water, land, and space? Furthermore, upon closer examination you will find that the moon moves through the sky, the crystal ball is held in by the hand, and the pan for receiving the water is put there by someone, but, where does the water that flows into the pan come from? The moon and the crystal balls cannot mix or unite, since they are far apart. Nor can it be that the essence of water exists spontaneously without an origin. You still do not know that in the treasury of the thus come one, the nature of water is true empty, and the nature of emptiness is true water. Pure in its origin, it pervades the Dharma realm. It accords with living beings' minds, in response to their capacity to know. A crystal ball is held up at a certain place, and their water comes forth. If crystal balls were held up throughout the Dharma realm, then throughout the Dharma realm, water would come forth. Since water can come forth throughout the entire world, can there be any fixed place which it is confined? 
It is experienced to whatever extent is dictated by the law of karma. People in the world, ignorant of this fact, are so deluded as to assign their origin to causes and conditions or to spontaneity. These mistakes, which arise from the discriminations and reasoning processes of the conscious mind, are nothing but the play of empty words which have no real meaning. Ananda. By nature, the wind has no substance, and its movements and stillness are erratic. You always adjust your robe as you enter the great assembly. When the corner of your Samgadi brushes the person next to you, there is a slight breeze which stirs against that person's face. Does this wind come from the corner of the Kashaya, does it arise from emptiness, or is it produced from the face of the person brushed by the wind? Ananda. If the wind comes from the corner of the Kashaya you are then clad in the wind, and your Kashaya should fly about and leave your body. I am now speaking Dharma in the midst of the assembly, and my robe remains motionless and hangs straight down. You should look closely at my robe to see whether there is any wind in it. It cannot be that the wind is stored somewhere in the robe, either. If it arose from emptiness, why wouldn't the wind brush against the man even when your robe did not move? Emptiness is constant in nature, thus, the wind should constantly arise. When there was no wind, the emptiness should disappear. You can perceive the disappearance of the wind, but, what would the disappearance of emptiness look like? If it did arise and disappear, it could not be what is called emptiness. Since it is what is called emptiness, how can it generate wind? If the wind came from the face of the person by your side, it would blow upon you while you set your robe in order. Why would it blow backwards upon the person from whom it was generated? Upon closer examination, you will find that the robe is set in order by yourself, the face blown by the wind belongs to the person by your side, and the emptiness is tranquil and not involved in movement. Where, then, does the wind come from that blows in this place? The wind and emptiness cannot mix and unite, since they are different from each other. Nor should it be that the wind spontaneously exists without an origin. You still do not know that in the treasury of the thus come one, the nature of wind is true emptiness, and the nature of emptiness is true wind. Pure at its origin, it pervades the Dharma realm. It accords with living beings' minds, in response to their capacity to know. Ananda. In the same way that you, as one person, move your robe slightly, and a small wind arises, so a wind arises in all countries if there is a similar movement throughout the Dharma realm. Since it can be produced throughout the world, how can there be any fixed place to which it is confined? It is experienced to whatever extent is dictated by the law of karma. People in the world, ignorant of this fact, are so deluded as to assign their origin to causes and conditions or to spontaneity. These mistakes, which arise from the discriminations and reasoning processes of the conscious mind, are nothing but the play of empty words which bear no real meaning. Ananda. The nature of emptiness has no shape, it is only apparent because of form. For instance, Srivasti is far from the river, so when the Sritriyas, Brahmins, Vaishyas, Sudras, Bharadvajas, Chandalas, and so forth, build their homes there, they dig well seeking water. Where a foot of earth is removed, there is a foot of emptiness, where as many as ten feet of earth are removed, there are ten feet of emptiness. The depth of the emptiness corresponds to the amount of earth removed. Does this emptiness come out of the dirt, does it exist because of the digging, or does it arise of itself without a cause? Moreover, Ananda, suppose this emptiness arose of itself without any cause. Why wasn't it unobstructed before the earth was dug? Quite the contrary, one saw only the great earth, there was no emptiness evident in it. If emptiness came about because of the removal of the earth, we should have seen it entering. The well as the earth was removed. If emptiness was not seen entering the well when the earth was first removed, how can we say that emptiness came about cause of the removal of the earth? If there is no going in or coming out, then there is no difference between the earth and emptiness. Why, then, doesn't emptiness come out of the well along with the earth in the process of digging? If emptiness appeared because of the digging, then the digging would bring out emptiness instead of the earth. If emptiness does not come out because of the digging, then the digging yields only earth. Why, then, do we see emptiness appear as the well is dug? You should consider this event more carefully. Look into it deeply, 
and you will find that the digging comes from the person's hand as it means of conveyance, and the earth exists because of a change in the ground. But what caused the emptiness to appear? The digging and the emptiness, one being substantial and the other insubstantial, do not function on the same plane. They do not mix and unite. Nor can it be that emptiness exists spontaneously without an origin. The nature of emptiness is completely pervasive, it is basically unmoving. You should know that emptiness and earth, water, fire, and wind are together called the five elements. Their natures are true and perfectly fused, and all are the treasury of the thus come one, fundamentally devoid of production and extinction. Ananda. Your mind is murky and confused, and you do not awaken to the fact that the source of the four elements is none other than the treasury of the thus come one. Why do you not take a look at emptiness to see whether it is subject to such relativities as coming and going? Do you know at all that in the treasury of the thus come one, the nature of enlightenment is true emptiness, and the nature of emptiness is true enlightenment? Pure at its origin, it pervades the Dharma realm. It accords with living beings' minds, in response to their capacity to know. Ananda. If in one place there is a well empty of earth, there will be emptiness filling up that one place. If there are wells empty of earth in the ten directions, there will be emptiness filling them up in the ten directions. Since it fills up the ten directions, is there any fixed location in which emptiness is found? It is experienced to whatever extent is dictated by the law of karma. People in the world, ignorant of this fact, are deluded as to assign their origin to causes and conditions or to spontaneity. These mistakes, which arise from the discriminations and reasoning processes of the conscious mind, are nothing but the play of empty words which bear no real meaning. Ananda. Seeing awareness does not perceive by itself. It depends upon form and emptiness for its existence. You are now in the Jetta Grove where you see brightness in the morning and darkness in the evening. Deep in the night you will see brightness when the moon arises and darkness when no moon is visible. The brightness and darkness are discerned by the seeing. Is the seeing identical in substance with brightness, darkness, and emptiness, or are they not the same substance? Are they the same and yet different, or are they not the same and yet not different? Ananda. Suppose seeing were one with brightness, darkness, and emptiness. It so happens that where there is darkness there is no brightness, and where there is brightness there is no darkness, because the two cancel each other out. If it were one with brightness, it would cease to exist in darkness. Such being the case, how could it perceive both brightness and darkness? If brightness and darkness differ from each other, how can they form a unity with seeing? which transcends production and destruction. Suppose that the essence of seeing were not of one substance with brightness and darkness, and that you were separate from light, darkness, and emptiness. Then what shape and appearance would the source of the seeing have, as you distinguish it? In the absence of darkness, brightness, and emptiness, the seeing would be the same as hair on a turtle or horns on a hare. How could we establish the seeing perception without the presence of the three qualities of brightness, darkness, and emptiness? How could we say that the seeing was one with darkness and brightness, since brightness and darkness are opposite? Yet, how can we say that it was different from the three qualities mentioned, since in their absence the seeing perception can never be established? How could we say that the seeing was not one with emptiness? since no boundary is established between them when they are separated from each other. How could we say that they were not different, since the seeing always remains unchanged, regardless of whether it is perceiving brightness or perceiving darkness? You should examine this even greater detail, investigate it minutely, consider and contemplate it carefully. The light comes from the sun and darkness from the absence of the moon, penetration belongs to emptiness, and solidity returns to the earth. From what does the essence of seeing arise? Seeing has awareness, and emptiness is inanimate, they do not mix and unite. Nor can it be that the essence of seeing arise spontaneously without an origin. If the faculties of seeing, hearing, and knowing are by nature all pervasive and unmoving, you should know that the stable, boundless emptiness, together with the unstable elements such as earth, water, fire, and wind, are together known as the six elements.
they are, in nature, true and perfectly fused, and thus are the treasury of the thus come one, fundamentally devoid of production and destruction. Ananda. Your nature is so submerged that you have not realized that your seeing, hearing, awareness, and knowing are basically the treasury of the thus come one. You should contemplate seeing, hearing, awareness, and knowing to see whether they are subject to production and extinction, whether they are identical or different, whether they are not subject to production and extinction, and whether they are not identical and not different. You still don't know that in the treasury of the thus come one, the nature of seeing is enlightened brightness, the essence of enlightenment is bright seeing. Pure at its origin, it pervades the Dharma realm. It accords with living beings' minds in response to their capacity to know. Consider, for example, the sense organ of seeing. Its seeing pervades the Dharma realm. The same is true of the luster of the wonderful virtue of hearing, smelling, tasting, contact, and knowing. Since they fill emptiness in the ten directions throughout the Dharma realm, how could there be any fixed location in which they are found? It is experienced to whatever extent is dictated by the law of karma. People in the world, ignorant of this fact, are so deluded as to assign its origin to causes and conditions or to spontaneity. These mistakes, which arise from the discriminations and reasoning processes of the conscious mind, are nothing but the play of empty words which have no real meaning. Ananda. The nature of consciousness has no source, but is a false manifestation based on the six organs and objects. Now, take a look at the entire holy assembly gathered here. As you glance at each one in turn, everything you see is like what is seen in a mirror, where nothing has any special distinction. However, your consciousness will identify them one by one, for example, Manjusri, Purna, Majalayana, Subhuti, and Zaraputra. Does the discerning faculty of the conscious mind come from seeing, from forms, or from emptiness, or does it arise suddenly without a cause? Ananda. Suppose your consciousness came from seeing. If there were no brightness, darkness, form, and emptiness. If these four did not exist, you could not see. With seeing non-existent, what would be the origin of your consciousness? If your consciousness arose from form rather than from seeing, it would not see either in brightness or in darkness. In the absence of brightness and darkness, it would not see form or emptiness, either. In the absence of form, where would your consciousness come from? If it came from emptiness, it is neither an appearance nor the seeing. Since it does not see, it is unable by itself to discern brightness, darkness, form, or emptiness. Since it is not an appearance, it is in itself devoid of external conditions. Therefore, there is no place for seeing, hearing, awareness, and knowing to be established. Since its location is devoid of these two, the consciousness that arises from emptiness would be the same as non-existent. Even if it did exist, it would not be the same as a thing. Even if your consciousness came forth from it, how would it discern anything? If it suddenly comes forth without a cause, why can't you discern the moonlight within the sunlight? You should investigate this even more carefully, discriminate it in detail, and look into it. The seeing belongs to your eyes, the appearances are considered to be the environment, what is an appearance is existent, what is without any appearance is non-existent. What, then, are the conditions that cause the consciousness to come into being? The consciousness moves and the seeing is quiet, they do not mix and unite. Smelling, hearing, awareness, and knowing are the same way. Nor should it be that the condition of consciousness exists spontaneously without an origin. If this conscious mind does not come from anywhere, you should know that the same is true of the mind, which makes distinctions, and the seeing, hearing, awareness, and knowing, which are all complete and tranquil. Their nature is without an origin. They and emptiness, earth, water, fire, wind are together called the seven elements. Their true natures are perfectly fused and all are the treasury of the thus come one, fundamentally devoid of production and extinction. Ananda. Your mind is coarse and shallow, and so you do not realize that the seeing and hearing are the treasury of the thus come one, and you do not discover that knowing is the same way. You should contemplate these six locations of consciousness. Are they the same or different? Are they empty or existent? 
Are they neither the same nor different? Are they neither empty nor existent? You basically do not know that in the treasury of the thus come one, the nature of consciousness is bright and knowing. Enlightened brightness is the true consciousness. The wonderful enlightenment is tranquil and pervades the Dharma realm. It encompasses the emptiness of the ten directions and issues forth in it. How can it have a location? It is experienced to whatever extent is dictated by the law of karma. People in the world, ignorant of this fact, are so deluded as to assign its origin to causes and conditions or to spontaneity. These mistakes, which arise from the discriminations and reasoning processes of the conscious mind, are nothing but the play of empty words which have no real meaning. 101. 7. Emotions. Emotions, negative or positive, are impermanent, they would not last, but we can't say we don't care about our emotions because they are impermanent. Buddhists cannot say both suffering and happiness are impermanent, so we need not seek nor avoid them. We all know that negative emotions lead to suffering, whereas positive ones lead to happiness, and the purpose of all Buddhists is to achieve happiness. So should try to achieve things that cause happiness, and whatever causes suffering we should deliberately happiness. According to Buddhism, there are seven kinds of emotions. What can be born with ease is happiness. Ordinary happiness is the gratification of a desire. However, as soon as the thing desired is achieved do we desire something else or some other kind of happiness, for our selfish desires are endless. Money cannot buy happiness, or wealth does not always conduce to happiness. In fact, real happiness is found within, and is not be defined in terms of wealth, power, honors, or conquests. The Buddha enumerates some kinds of happiness for a layman. They are the happiness of possession, health, wealth, longevity, beauty, joy, strength, property, children, etc. The Buddha does not advise all of us to renounce our worldly lives and pleasures and retire to solitude. However, he advised lay disciples to share the enjoyment of wealth with others. We should use wealth for ourselves, but we should also use wealth for the welfare of others. What we have is only temporary, what we preserve we leave and go. Only karmas will have to go with us along the endless cycle of births and deaths. The Buddha taught about the happiness of lay disciples as follows. A poor, but peace life is real happiness. Leading a blameless life is one of the best sources of happiness, for a blameless person is a blessing to himself and to others. He is admired by all and feels happier, being affected by the peaceful vibrations of others. However, it is very difficult to get a good name from all. The wise men try to be indifferent to external approbation, try to obtain this spiritual happiness by transcending of material pleasures. Then the Buddha continued to remind monks and nuns. Nirvana bliss, which is the bliss of relief from suffering, is the highest form of happiness. Thus, the Buddha taught on happiness in the Dharmapada Sutra. Happy is the birth of Buddhas. Happy is the teaching of the true law. Happy is the harmony in the Sangha. Happy is the discipline of the united ones. Dharmapada 194. Oh! Happily do we live without hatred among the hateful. Among hateful men we dwell unhating. Dharmapada 197. Oh! Happily do we live in good health among the ailing. Among the ailing we dwell in good health. Dharmapada 198. Oh! Happily do we live without greed for sensual pleasures among the greedy. Among the greedy we dwell free from greed. Dharmapada 199. Oh! Happily do we live without any hindrances. We shall always live in peace and joy as the gods of the radiant realm, Dharmapada 200. Victory breeds hatred, defeat breeds suffering, giving up both victory and defeat will lead us to a peaceful and happy life, Dharmapada 201. If by giving up a small happiness or pleasure, one may behold a larger joy. A far-seeing and wise man will do this, a wise man will leave this small pleasure and look for a larger one, Dharmapada 290. It is pleasant to have friends when need arises. Enjoyment is pleasant when shared with one another. Merit is pleasant when life is at its end. Shunning of, giving up, all evil is pleasant, Dharmapada 331. To revere the mother is pleasant, to revere the father is pleasant, 
to revere the monks is pleasant, to revere the sages is pleasant, Dharmapada 332. To be virtue and to old age is pleasant, to have steadfast faith is pleasant, to attain wisdom is pleasant, not to do evil is pleasant, Dharmapada 333. According to Buddhist theories, sorrow and joy, each producing the other, or each being inherent in the other. There is no greater love in this world than the love of the mother and father. If a person, carrying father on the left shoulder and mother on the right shoulder, were to walk around this Sumera mountain hundreds of thousands of times, with blood covering both feet, it would still not be enough to repay the love and hardship of child rearing, Dhammapada. The Buddha taught. Love is the only way to destroy hatred. Hatred cannot be defeated with more hatred. Buddha taught. When you hate others, you yourself become unhappy. But when you love others, everyone is happy. In order to eliminate hate you should meditate on loving-kindness, pity and compassion. Greed and lust are unrestrained desires for material possessions such as food, sleeping, sexual intercourse, etc., all related to sensual pleasures. We also have a desire for appropriations, showing off, authority, and profits. The cover of desire which overlays the mind and prevents the good from appearing. Since they are like bodiless barrel, neither obsessive greed nor desire can be stopped or satisfied. Through tricks, expedients, and manipulations, we try to reach our goal irrespective of whatever happens to others. We Buddhists must see that greedy people are generally selfish, wicked, and prone to cause sufferings to others. As a result, they transform this world into a battlefield where tears are shed like streams and sufferings rise like an ocean tide. Desire for and love of the things of this life, such as craving, greed, affection, desire. Most people define happiness as the satisfaction of all desires. The desires are boundless, but our ability to realize them is not, and unfulfilled desires always create suffering. When desires are only partially fulfilled, we have a tendency to continue to pursue until a complete fulfillment is achieved. Thus, we create even more suffering for us and for others. We can only realize the true happiness and a peaceful This is one of the great steps towards the shore of liberation. The Buddha taught. Craving and desire are the cause of all unhappiness or suffering. Everything sooner or later must change, so do not become attached to anything. Instead devote yourself to clearing your mind and finding the truth, lasting happiness. Knowing how to feel satisfied with few possessions help us destroy greed and desire. This means being content with material conditions that allow us to be healthy and strong enough to cultivate. This is an effective way to cut through the net of passions and desires, attain a peaceful state of mind, and have more time to help others. In nowadays society, one fears everything fear of no money, fear of homelessness, fear of sickness, old age and death, etc. In fact, because of lack of understanding about the real nature of life, we try to maintain things that we are unable to, that's why we feel fear of everything. Buddhists should always remember that life is changeable, and it composes of a bundle of changeable, impermanent elements. Once we understand the real nature of life, we don't have the feeling of fear in life anymore. 102. Greed and Desire. Craving, greed, affection, desire. Most people define happiness as the satisfaction of all desires. The desires are boundless, but our ability to realize them is not, and unfulfilled desires always create suffering. When desires are only partially fulfilled, we have a tendency to continue to pursue until a complete fulfillment is achieved. Thus, we create even more suffering for us and for others. We can only realize the true happiness and a peaceful state of mind when our desires are few. This is one of the great steps towards the shore of liberation. The Buddha taught. Craving and desire are the cause of all unhappiness or suffering. Everything sooner or later must change, so do not become attached to anything. Instead devote yourself to clearing your mind and finding the truth, lasting happiness. Knowing how to feel satisfied with few possessions help us destroy greed and desire. This means being content with material conditions that allow us to be healthy and strong enough to cultivate. This is an effective way to cut through the net of passions and desires, 
attain a peaceful state of mind, and have more time to help others. In the middle length discourses, the Buddha taught. O Bixus, with sense desires as cause, with sense desires as motives, kings are fighting with kings, Katiya are fighting with Katiya, Brahmanas are fighting with Brahmanas, householders are fighting with householders, mother is fighting with son, son is fighting with mother, father is fighting with brother, brother is fighting with sister, sister is fighting with brother, friend is fighting with friend. When they engage themselves in fighting, in quarrels, in disputes, they attack each other with hands, they attack each other with stones, they attack each other with sticks, they attack each other with swords. Thus they are going to death, or to suffer like death. O Bixus, with sense desires as cause, with sense desires as motives, they take hold of spears, they take hold of shields, they wear bows and arrows. They arrange themselves in two lines, and arrows are thrown at each other, knives are thrown at each other, swords are slashed at each other. They pierce each other with arrows, they slash each other with knives, they cut each other heads with swords. Thus they are going to death, or to suffer like death. 103. Six Desires. Emotions, negative or positive, are impermanent, they would not last, but we can't say we don't care about our emotions because they are impermanent. Buddhists cannot say both suffering and happiness are impermanent, so we need not seek nor avoid them. We all know that negative emotions lead to suffering, whereas positive ones lead to happiness, and the purpose of all Buddhists is to achieve happiness. So should try to achieve things that cause happiness, and whatever causes suffering we should deliberately happiness. According to Buddhism, six emotions arising from the six organs of sense. Emotions arising from the eyes. Emotions arising from the ears. Emotions arising from the nose. Emotions arising from the tongue. Emotions arising from the body. Emotions arising from the mind. Practitioners of mindfulness always consider the six senses are objects of cultivation. According to Bhikkhu Piyananda in the Gems of Buddhism Wisdom, you must always be aware of the sense organs such as eye, ear, nose, tongue and body, and the contact they are having with the outside world. You must be aware of the feelings that are arising as a result of this contact. Eye is now in contact with forms, rupa, ear is now in contact with sound. Nose is now in contact with smell, tongue is now in contact with taste, body is now in contact with touching, and mind is now in contact with all things, dharma. 104. Desire. We are living in a material world where we must encounter all kinds of objects such as sights, sounds, tastes, sensations, thoughts and ideas, act. Desire arises from contact with these pleasing objects. Buddhists should always remember that desire not only obscures our mind, but it is also a main cause of grasping which causes sufferings and afflictions, forces us to continue to wander in the samsara. Desire is one of the twelve links in the chain of causation, nidanas. Its source is delusion caused by attraction to the six objects of sense. Thus, the Buddha taught in the Dharmapada Sutra. It is difficult to renounce the world. It is difficult to be a householder. It is painful to associate with those who are not friends. It is painful to be wandering in the samsara forever. Reaching the enlightenment and let wander no more. Let suffer no more. Dharmapada 302. Whoever binds to craving, his sorrows flourish like well-watered barana grass. Dharmapada 335. Whoever in this world overcomes this unruly craving, his sorrows fall away just like water drops from a lotus leaf, Dharmapada. 336. This is my advice to you. Root out craving, root it out, just like barana grass is rooted out. Let not Mara crush you again and again as a flood crushes a reed. Dharmapada 337. Latent craving is not conquered, suffering recovers and grows again and again, just like a tree hewn down grows up again as long as its roots is unrooted, Dharmapada 338. If in any man, the 36 streams of craving are still flowing, such deluded person is still looking for pleasure and passion, and torrential thoughts of lust sweep him away, Dharmapada 339. 
streams of pleasure and passion flow in all directions, just like the creeper sprouts and stands. Seeing the creeper that has sprung up in your mind, cut it off with wisdom, Dharmapada 340. Common people are subject to attachment and thirst, they are always happy with pleasure, they run after passion. They look for happiness, but such men caught in the cycle of birth and decay again and again, Dharmapada 341. Men who are crazed with craving, are terrified like hunted hares. The more they hold fast by fetters, bonds, and afflictions, the longer they suffer, Dharmapada 342. Men who are crazed with craving, are terrified just like hunted hares. Therefore, a monk who wishes his own passionlessness, should first banish craving, Dharmapada 343. He who is free from desire for the household, finds pleasure, of asceticism or monastic life, in the forest, yet run back to that very home. Look at that man. He runs right back into that very bondage again. Dharmapada 344. To a wise man, the bondage that is made of hemp, wood or iron, is not a strong bond, the longing for wives, children, jewels, and ornaments is a greater and far stronger attachment, Dharmapada 345. The wise people say that that bond is very strong. Such fetters seem supple, but hard to break. Break them. Cut off desire and renounce the world. Dharmapada 346. A man infatuated with lust falls back into the stream as a spider into the web spun by itself. He who cuts off this bond, retire from the world, with no clinging, will leave all sorrow behind, Dharmapada. 347. He who has reached the goal, without fear, without craving and without desire, has cut off the thorns of life. This is his final mortal body, Dharmapada 351. He who is without craving, without attachment, who understands subtleties of words and meanings, they are truly a great wise who bear the final mortal body, Dharmapada 352. Strive hard to cut off the stream of desires. Oh! Brahman! Knowing that all conditioned things will perish. Oh! Brahman! You are a knower of the unmade nirvana. Dharmapada 383. 105. Ill will. Ill will or hatred is one of the three poisons in Buddhism, greed, anger, ignorance. This is one of the three fires which burn in the mind until allowed to die for fueling. Anger manifests itself in a very crude manner, destroying the practitioner in a most effective way. To subdue anger and resentment, we must develop a compassionate mind. According to Buddhist psychology, the mental factor of aversion is always linked to the experience of pain. One may be greedy and happy, but never angry and happy at the same time. Anyone who cultures hatred, anger, malice, nurses revenge or keeps alive a grudge is bound to experience much suffering, for he has laid hold a very potent source of it. Those who exercise their hatred on others as in killing, torturing or maiming, may expect birth in a state, compared in the scriptural simile to a pitfall of glowing situations, where they will experience feelings which are exclusively painful, sharp, severe. Only in such an environment will they be able to experience all the misery which they, by their own cruelty to others, have brought upon themselves. The Buddha taught. Bandits who steal merits are of no comparison to hatred and anger. Because when hatred and anger arise, inevitable innumerable karma will be created. Immediately thereafter, hundreds and thousands of obstructions will appear, masking the proper teachings of enlightenment, burying and dimming the Buddha nature. Therefore, a thought of hatred and anger had just barely risen, ten thousands of karmic doors will open immediately. It is to say with just one thought of hatred, one must endure all such obstructions and obstacles. In the Dharmapada Sutra, the Buddha taught. One should give up anger, one should abandon pride. One should overcome all fetters, no suffering befall him who calls nothing his own, Dharmapada 221. He who controls his anger which arises as a rolling chariot. He is a true charioteer. Other people are only holding the rein, Dharmapada 222. Conquer anger by love, conquer evil by good, conquer stingy by giving, conquer the liar by truth, 
Dharmapada 223.1 should guard against the bodily anger or physical action and should control the body. One should give up evil conduct of the body. One should be of good bodily conduct, Dharmapada 231. One should guard against the anger of the tongue, one should control the tongue. One should give up evil conduct in speech. One should be of good conduct in speech, Dharmapada 232.1 should guard against the anger of the mind, one should control the mind. One should give up evil conduct of the mind. One should practice virtue with the mind, Dharmapada 233. 106. To subdue lust, anger and ignorance. The karma of greed, anger and delusion manifest themselves in many forms, which are impossible to describe fully. According to most venerable Thichthian Tom in the Pure Land Buddhism and theory and practice, there are four basic ways to subdue them. Depending on the circumstances, the practitioner can use either one of these four methods to counteract the karma of greed, anger and delusion. The first method is suppressing afflictions with the mind. There are only two points of divergence between the deluded and the enlightened, i.e., Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Purity is Buddhahood, defilement is the state of sentient beings. Because the Buddhas are in accord with the pure mind, they are enlightened, fully endowed with spiritual powers and wisdom. Because sentient beings are attached to worldly dusts, they are deluded and revolve in the cycle of birth and death. To practice pure land is to go deep into the Buddha recitation samadhi, awakening to the original mind and attaining Buddhahood. Therefore, if any deluded, agitated thought develops during Buddha recitation, it should be severed immediately, allowing us to return to the state of the pure mind. This is the method of counteracting afflictions with the mind. The second method is suppressing afflictions with naumanin. When deluded thoughts arise which cannot be suppressed with the mind, we should move to the second stage and visualize principles. For example, whenever the affliction of greed develops, we should visualize the principles of impurity, suffering, impermanence, and no self. Whenever the affliction of anger arises, we should visualize the principles of compassion, forgiveness and emptiness of all dharmas. The third method is suppressing afflictions with phenomena. People with heavy karma who cannot suppress their afflictions by visualizing principles alone, we should use phenomena that is external forms. For example, individuals who are prone to anger and delusion and are aware of their shortcomings should, when they are on the verge of bursting into a quarrel, immediately leave the scene and slowly sip a glass of cold water. Those heavily afflicted with the karma of lust attachment who cannot suppress their afflictions through visualization of principle should arrange to be near virtuous elders and concentrate on Buddhist activities or distant travel to overcome lust and memories gradually as mentioned in the saying out of sight, out of mind. This is because sentient beings' minds closely parallel their surroundings and environment. If the surroundings disappear, the mind loses its anchor, and gradually, all memories fade away. The fourth method is suppressing afflictions with repentance and recitation. In addition to the above three methods, which range from the subtle to the gross, there is also a fourth. Repentance and the recitation of sutras, mantras and the Buddha's name. If performed regularly, repentance and recitation eradicate bad karma and generate merit and wisdom. For this reason, many cultivators in times past, before receiving the precepts or embarking upon some great dharma work, such as building a temple or translating a sutra, would vow to recite the great compassion mantra tens of thousands of times, or to recite the entire larger Prajnaparamita Sutra, the longest sutra in the Buddha canon. In the past, during lay retreats, if a practitioner had heavy karmic obstructions and could not recite the Buddha's name with a pure mind or clearly visualize Amitabha Buddha, the presiding Dharma master would usually advise him to follow the practice of bowing repentance with incense. This method consists of lighting a long incense stick and respectfully bowing in repentance while uttering the Buddha's name until the stick is burnt out. There are cases of individuals with heavy karma who would spend the entire 7 or 21 days retreat doing nothing but bowing with incense. 107. Wrong Views. According to Buddhism, perverted, wrong, views are views that do not accept the law of cause and effect 
not consistent with the Dharma, one of the five heterodox opinions in Ten Evils. This view arises from a misconception of the real characteristic of existence. There were at least 62 heretical views, views of the externalist or non-Buddhist views, in the Buddhist time. Buddhism emphasizes on theory of causation. Understanding the theory of causation means to solve most of the question of the causes of sufferings and afflictions. Not understanding or refuse of understanding of the theory of causation means a kind of wrong view in Buddhism. According to the Buddha, sentient beings suffer from sufferings and afflictions because of desires, aversions, and delusion, and the causes of these harmful actions are not only from ignorance, but also from wrong views. Wrong views also means holding to the view of total annihilation, or the view that death ends life, or world extinction and the end of causation, in contrast with the view that body and soul are eternal, both views being heterodox. The philosophic doctrine that denies a substantial reality to the phenomenal universe. Wrong views according to Hinayana Buddhism. Wrong view is the akasality view, which states that there is no cause or condition for the defilement and purification of beings, that beings are defiled and purified by chance or necessity. The inefficacy of action view, which claims that deeds have no efficacy in producing results and thus invalidates moral distinctions. Anihilism, which denies the survival of the personality in any form after death, thus negating the moral significance of deed. Also according to the Hinayana Buddhism, there are another ten kinds of wrong views. There is no such virtue in generosity. This means that there is no good effect in giving alms. There is no such virtue as liberal alms giving. There is no such virtue as offering gifts to guests. This means there is no effort in such charitable actions. There is neither fruit nor result of good or evil deeds. There is no such belief as this world. There is no such belief as a world beyond i.e. those born here do not accept a past existence and those living here do not accept future life. There is no mother. There is no father i.e. there is no effect in anything done to them. There are no beings that died and are reborn. There are no righteous and well-disciplined recluses and Brahmins who, having realized by their own super-intellect this world and the world beyond, make known the same, Buddhas and Arahants. According to Bhikkhu Bodhi and Abhidhamma, there are three kinds of wrong views. Nihilism, Nathakadidi, which denies the survival of the personality in any form after death, thus negating the moral significance of deeds. The causality view, Ahitukadidi which states that there is no cause or condition for the defilement and purification of beings, that beings are defiled and purified by chance, fate, or necessity. The inefficacy of action view, Akariya Didi, which claims that deeds have no efficacy in producing results and thus invalidates moral distinctions. According to the simile of the snake in the middle-length discourses of the Buddha, the Buddha taught about someone who does not have wrong views as follows, here Bikis. Someone who hears the Tathagata or a disciple of the Tathagata teaching the Dharma for the elimination of all standpoints, decisions, obsessions, adherences, and underlying tendencies, for the stilling of all formations, for the relinquishing of all attachments, for the destruction of craving, for dispassion, for cessation, for nirvana. He thinks that he will be annihilated, he will be perished. He will have no more sorrow, grieve, and lament. He does not weep beating his breast and become distraught. In the Dharmapada Sutra, the Buddha taught. Those who embrace the wrong views, are ashamed of what is not shameful, and are not ashamed of what is shameful, will not be able to avoid the hell, Dharmapada 316. Those who fear when they should not fear, and don't fear in the fearsome, embrace these false views, will not be able to avoid the hell, Dharmapada 317. Those who perceive faults in the faultless, and see no wrong in what is wrong, such men, embracing false doctrines, will not be able to avoid the hell, Dharmapada 318. 108. Remnants of Habits. Remnants of habits are old habits or the accumulation of the past thoughts, affections, deeds, and passions. Zen practitioners should be clear about the basic problem of the vasana, old habits. 
We practice meditation to eliminate those bad habits and faults, to wash the mind so it can have clean and pure thoughts, to purge ourselves of jealousy towards worthy and capable individuals, to banish forever all thoughts of envy and obstructiveness, of ignorance and afflictions. If we can do this, then our true mind, our wisdom, will manifest. The remnants of habits which persist after passion has been subdued, only the Buddha can eliminate or uproot them all. The Sanskrit word for internal formation is samujana. It means to crystallize. Every one of us has internal formations that we need to take care of. With the practice of meditation we can undo these knots and experience transformation. According to Buddhism, remnants of habits are the impression of any past action or experience remaining unconsciously in the mind, or the present consciousness of past perceptions, or past knowledge derived from memory. Remnants of habits are the force of habit. Good or evil karma from habits or practice in a former existence. The uprising or recurrence of thoughts, passions or delusions after the passion or delusion has itself been overcome, the remainder or remaining influence of illusion. This is the perfuming impression or memory. The habit energy of memory from past actions, recollection of the past or former impression, which ignites discriminations and prevents enlightenment. Remnants of habits also mean memory. Seeds, Vasanavija. Every act, mental and physical, leaves its seeds behind, which is planted in the alayu for future germination under favorable conditions. This notion plays an important role in the vijnap. Remnants of habits are habitual perfuming, perfumed habits, or knowledge which is derived from memory. According to the Abhidharma, remnants of habits mean habitual karmas, which are deed that one habitually or constantly performs either good or bad. Habits, whether good or bad, become second nature. They more or less tend to mold the character of a person. In the absence of weighty karma and a potent death proximate karma, this type of karma generally assumes the rebirth generative function. According to the awakening of faith, the indescribable vasana or the influence of primal ignorance on the Bhutadathata, producing all illusions. The permeation of the pure self-essence of the mind of true thusness by ignorance or wisdom which then appears in the manifest world. However, there are also habits that help people staying away from afflictions. According to the Flower Adornment Sutra, Chapter 38, there are ten kinds of habit energy of great enlightening beings. Enlightening beings who abide by these can forever get rid of all afflictive habit energies and attain Buddha's habit energies of great knowledge, the knowledge that is not energized by habit. The habit energy of determination for enlightenment. The habit energy of roots of goodness, the habit energy of edifying sentient beings, the habit energy of seeing Buddha, the habit energy of undertaking birth in pure worlds, the habit energy of enlightening practice, the habit energy of vows, the habit energy of transcendence, the habit energy of meditation on equality, and the habit energy of various differentiations of state. Remnants of habits also mean internal formations. The Sanskrit word for internal formation is samujana. It means to crystallize. Every one of us has internal formations that we need to take care of. With the practice of meditation we can undo these knots and experience transformation. In our consciousness there are blocks of pain, anger, and frustration called internal formations. They are also called knots because they tie us up and obstruct our freedom. After a while, it become very difficult for us to transform, to undo the knots, and we cannot ease the constriction of this crystal formation. Not all internal formations are unpleasant. There are also pleasant internal formations, but they still make us suffer. When you taste, hear, or see something pleasant, then that pleasure can become a strong internal knot. When the object of your pleasure disappears, you miss it and you begin searching for it. You spend a lot of time and energy trying to experience it again. If you smoke marijuana or drink alcohol and begin to like it, then it becomes an internal formation in your body and in your mind. You cannot get it off your mind. You will always look for more. The strength of the internal knot is pushing you and controlling you. So internal formations deprive us of our freedom. When someone insults us or does something unkind to us, an internal formation is created in our consciousness. 
if we don't know how to undo the internal knots and transform them, the knots will stay there for a long time. And the next time someone says something or does something to us of the same nature, that internal formation will grow stronger. As knots are blocks of pain in us, our internal formations have the power to push us, to dictate our behavior. Falling in love is a big internal formation. Once you are in love, you think only of the other person. You are not free anymore. You cannot do anything, you cannot study, you cannot work, you cannot enjoy the sunshine or the beauty of nature around you. You can think only of the object of your love. So love can also be a huge internal knot. Pleasant or unpleasant, both kinds of knots take away our liberty. That's why we should guard our body and our mind very carefully to prevent these knots from taking root in us. Drugs, alcohol, and tobacco can create internal formations in our body. And anger, craving, jealousy, despair can create internal formations in our mind. Anger is an internal formation, and since it makes us suffer, we try our best to get rid of it. Psychologists like the expression getting it out of your system. As a Buddhist, you should generate the energy of mindfulness and take good care of anger every time it manifests through meditation practice. Mindfulness does not fight anger or despair. Mindfulness is there in order to recognize. To be mindful of something is to recognize that something is the capacity of being aware of what is going on in the present moment. According to most venerable Thich Nhat Hanh in anger, the best way to to be mindful of anger is when breathing in I know that anger has manifested in me, breathing out, I smile towards my anger. This is not an act of suppression or of fighting. It is an act of recognizing. Once we recognize our anger, we are able to take good care of it or to embrace it with a lot of awareness, a lot of tenderness. Mindfulness recognizes, is aware of its presence, accepts and allows it to be there. Mindfulness is like a big brother who does not suppress his younger brother's suffering. He simply says, Dear brother, I'm here for you. You take your younger brother in your arms and you comfort him. This is exactly our practice. Our anger is us, and our compassion is also us. To meditate does not mean to fight. In Buddhism, the practice of meditation should be the practice of embracing and transforming, not of fighting. When anger comes up in us, we should begin to practice mindful breathing right away. Breathing in, I know that anger is in me. Breathing out, I am taking good care of my anger. If you don't know how to treat yourself with compassion, how can you treat another person with compassion? When anger arises, continue to practice mindful breathing and mindful walking to generate the energy of mindfulness. Continue to tenderly embrace the energy of anger within you. Anger may continue to be there for some time, but you are safe, because the Buddha is in you, helping you to take good care of your anger. The energy of mindfulness is the energy of the Buddha. When you practice mindful breathing and embracing your anger, you are under the protection of the Buddha. There is no doubt about it. The Buddha is embracing you and your anger with a lot of compassion. 109. Taints. In Buddhism, taints mean basic defilements of greed, ill will, anger, and ignorance, delusion. Taints and afflictions are used interchangeably. Taint also means delusion or affliction, deluded, or afflicted by holding on to the illusory ideas and things of life. The Kalisa are contaminations of attachment to the pleasures of the senses. Kalisa are contaminations of attachment to false views. Kalisa are contaminations of attachment to moral and ascetic practices. Kalisa are contaminations of attachment to the belief in a self. According to the Connected Discourses of the Buddha, Chapter Asanavago, Searches, there are three affluences or taints that feed the stream of mortality or transmigration. Desire or the taint of sensuality, material or phenomenal existence, or the taint of existence, the taint of ignorance, or the ignorance of the way of escape. By oneself the evil is done, by oneself one is defiled or purified. Purity or impurity depend on oneself. No one can purify another. In the Dharmapada Sutra, the Buddha taught. Non-recitation is the rust of incantation, non-repair is the rust of houses, sloth is the rust of bodily beauty and shelters, carelessness is the rust of the cultivator, watcher, 
Dharmapada 241. Misconduct is the taint of a woman, stinginess is the taint of a donor. Taints are indeed all evil things, both in this world and in the next. Dharmapada 242. The worst taint is ignorance, the greatest taint. Oh. Big shoe. Cast aside this taint and become taintless. Dharmapada 243. This is the end of this video. Thank you for listening. Please continue to support and help this channel grow. As you already know, Buddha emphasized the importance of generosity supporting the spread of the Dharma for spiritual growth. We can cultivate this virtue in our digital age. Now I need your help spreading the Buddha teaching further by subscribing, liking, and sharing our channel. You're supporting the dissemination of valuable teachings, much like this Sangha was supported in the past. Your engagement accumulates positive karma for you and helps make the Dharma accessible to a wider audience, a meritorious act indeed. Let's do this with pure intentions, free from attachment and selfishness, fostering a sense of community and supporting our own spiritual journey. These principles, rooted in Buddhist ethics, continue to guide us. You will receive great blessings for supporting the propagation of Buddha's teachings in a very simple way by subscribing, liking, and sharing to help spreading the Buddha teaching to all human beings. Wishing you and your family always have a peaceful and happy life.